Hello, welcome again to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Today, my guest is Jim Miller. He's actually part of the Stability Network. I heard, I don't know, Jim, if you listen to, the, to my interview with Toffer Jerome, He's part of the, yeah, he's part of the same uh, initiative. And I just, and he was the one actually who introduced me to the Stability Network. And then I contacted you guys and said, listen, I, I explained what I did. And, and many of you were going to have a kind of a series of interviews with some of the leaders of the Stability Network. And I just want to introduce it quickly. It was founded around 2011 by someone called Catherine Switz. She struggled with mental illness from what I read. And I believe that she mentions that the doctor told them, uh, we don't know if you're going to function with this condition. And she decided after reading books and one of the, one of the books was Jay Jeminson's, um, I can't remember, can't remember, The Unquiet, Unquiet Mind. I don't know if you've read that, but she talks about her struggle with mental illness and then she's, she's bipolar. And she said, no, it's not going to happen to me. And then she started talking to some people about her struggles. And then she decided to create this, the, what she calls the Stability Network, which you are a part of. And what they do is, I, I'm go actually going to read their mission statement. We are dedicated to making positive stories about mental health more plentiful than stories of fear and negativity. So very straightforward, and this is what people like you do. You come speak publicly about your struggles. In your case, it was the death of your father in 1992. You were, was it 22 at the time, Jim? Well, well welcome, to, welcome to the podcast, first of all, and thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Thanks, Paula. Thanks very much. Yeah, this is my first outing actually with the Civility Network, but I was introduced to, I joined a similar sort of group back in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then I met Catherine at, at an event um, that was organized by, the, by this UK group and I've signed up and this is my first, uh, first outing. And, oh, uh, good, good. So I'm, I'm the lucky one to have you first, huh? I guess so, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, in... in and some of you, uh, some of you, it, it's different stories. Some share stories of loss, suicide loss. Some share stories of suicide ideation. Some share stories of multiple. We're going to have someone uh, within the next few weeks. We're going to, I'm going to publish a, an interview with someone who had like multiple. I mean, the moment when she wrote to me all the diagnosis she had over her life. I mean, when you think of a mental illness, she had it. It's one of those cases that you look at it, so oh my goodness, it's so many mistakes have been made with this woman. But anyway, some of them, that's what they share, their struggle with mental illness and treatments and everything. But I love that you're here with us because you're going to talk about something that I am familiar with, losing a father to suicide. And you were so young, you were 22 at the time. Was that it? That's right, I was, yeah. Yeah, so what happened? Tell us a little bit about your father first. Well, I mean, what happened? It's, there's a whole lifetime of ingredients that go into a decision that he may or may not have really wanted to take at the end of the day. It may have just been a mistake. Um, but he, you know, he was born into a, into a wealthy kind of Midlands family, um, there was a family business that had been built up over numerous generations. Um, I think the the early kind of pioneers of the, of the family they were German and they, they they were hardworking and industrious and um, and I think there was a bit of a moral decline after a couple of generations and there was probably some alcoholism creeping into the family and uh, the business became more of a leisure activity and um, and my dad inherited the business and. He, I, you know, I don't think he was really up to the job, basically, of um, adapting to the to the environment. Um, and he had relationship issues. Um, he'd been through a divorce from his first, you know, his first uh, first wife. I've got two elder half sisters from from that marriage, ten and twelve years older than me. Um, and yeah, he was going through uh, having relationship problems with my mother um, at the time that it happened. Um, 
you know, I think there were some mental health issues thrown in there as well as a result of all of the stress. He was certainly struggling with his sleep and I think some of his thinking was becoming quite confused and, you know, he was under a lot of pressure, pressure and stress. Um, his children had grown up, you know, my, I, I was 22, my younger sister was 20, so I guess he felt that that you know that his children were no longer dependents in the same way there was uh, mm. less of a need to be there for them in some way um and then the last straw was that the family dog he was on his own in, in spain um you know his family were all off living their own lives his, his wife had, had left him mm -hmm. and um and the family dog died and that was the last straw and that was when that was when he died um yeah, yeah. a lot it just sounds like a lot a lot of losses right I think so, and I, and I don't think he was equipped to deal with them really. I mean, he'd he'd struggled with alcoholism earlier in his life. Um, he'd stopped drinking, but uh, that was. Uh, I don't think he'd really dealt with the underlying emotional issues. He'd just stopped mm -hmm. drinking. He had liver cirrhosis and was was yeah, you know, yeah. close to death. Um, and you know, this he'd grown up. I mean, he was he, he was a teenager during the war, and he grew up in in a family where there wasn't a lot of emotional nurturing really he, he was brought up by nannies he was sent to boarding school when he was eight wow. you know quite scared of his mother really who was she was a tremendously strong and very powerful woman um and we we, we all loved her very much she died at 104 and she was you wow. know kind of real trooper and matriarch of the family but from a, a a nurturing point of view she wasn't the kind of woman who she wouldn't give you a hug or um mm. or even really listen um to, to i don't think um, so I, I think he, I don't think he grew up with the right kind of love really. And, you know, he, I think he, he wasn't really able to take care of himself on a deep level. He needed a wife to take care of him. And when, when my mother left him, I think that was, that I don't think he could deal with that again. You know, the loss of a mother, the loss of a first wife, now the loss of a second wife and never really having, having learned to properly look out for himself. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when I went to stay with him before in the Easter before he died in the in the early May, um, and he was trying really hard to look after himself. He'd he'd cooked himself some some sprouts, some Brussels sprouts. Mm. <laughs> we sat and had a bowl of Brussels sprouts each, um, and you know it was kind of that was it. That was the whole meal. That was it. Yeah. I mean, up until then, he'd you know if, if my mum had gone away for a week or so, she would cook all the meals and leave them for him in the freezer. And he you know. Um, so he'd always been taken care of in a way, and he'd always been, I think he needed mothering. And yeah, I think there was an abandonment thing there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there was, I think financially he was suffering as well. And, you know, and then I, I believe he got into sort of a downward spiral. I mean, he went to see GPs who didn't really help him. They just gave him medication, or well, what they called medication. I mean, sleep, very mm -hmm. strong sleeping pills to try and help okay. him get some sleep, but you know, um so yeah that, that's that's it really that that's mm -hmm. what happened it's it's uh it's sad um yeah. yeah he'd been talking about moving to the south of france and he thought people would visit him there which is why he said that he'd like to to go there um but i think I think he was just, he was very desperate and also he was a very dignified man and he was a man with a lot of integrity and he was a man who put on a, he kind of put on a very strong front in a way of being a certain way, but I think he always found it quite hard to really deal with his emotions mm -hmm. and um, so it was a shock to yeah. hear the news of his death, but in a way looking back I can see that he was kind of like a, co a bubbling cauldron inside putting on a front, but just not really able to deal with all of these strong feelings. Yeah, and it was too much. And as you say now, looking back, right? So now you've had, what, 30 years since he died? What is Almost, yeah, it's coming up more, years. more or less 30 years. But let, let's go back to when it happened, because here you are, 23 years old, very young. And from what you told me, you were the, the person who was uh, responsible for taking care of the body and you actually saw the scene where he took his life which was I'm sure very traumatic for you and right after that you had what you call a psychotic episode can we talk a little bit about that what happened then yeah sure I mean I'm not sure why 
I went on my own really, but I did. I think I was quite a headstrong and overconfident 22 year old. I, you know, I was at university and I'd been sent to school when I was eight. And I think I was very confident and always felt that I could deal with things. And in this case, I, I couldn't. I, it was much more than I was able to deal with. Um, and I guess there were issues in the family after, you know, because my mum had left my dad, his death happened in the, in the wake of this family breakup and it was all quite fresh. And, you know, I think there were just some very, very strong feelings. It was quite hard to take it all in. Um, and so I went to the, 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 the flat where he'd been living and um, they hadn't really tidied up the flat properly. And it was upsetting to see some of his personal items, including the, the, the object that he used to, um, to, to kill himself. Um, so it was shocking. It was d deeply shocking, actually. And I was in shock anyway. And then to see that, I think I had a trauma response. Um, for a long time afterwards, I was kind of stuck on that moment and I could see things exactly as they were. I also felt enormous resentment towards the Spanish police for some reason, for some time, for, for not... Um, of course, because they, they allowed you to go there without tidying up the place, is that it? Yeah, exactly. I did. I mean, yeah. not. I mean, you know, the, the, I see it differently now, um, but it affected me at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and then later on, then I went to, to deal with the undertakers and they suggested that I didn't see the body, which made me think, well, why? And, you know, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, and I found that a bit upsetting, I think. And also they were, this was in Spain and they were, uh, they were kind of a Colombian family run undertakers and very rough and it was just, mm. it, 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 I don't know. The, the whole experience was very traumatic. It was, yeah, it was a tough experience, yeah. And then my, my grandmother lived down the coast about a two hour drive and I had to drive down the coast to spend time with, with her um, mm -hmm. before flying back. And that was when, I can remember exactly when the, you know, when the period of mania started, basically, when I started having, when my thinking started going wrong. And mm -hmm. I started thinking that, you know, not exactly hearing voices, but just feeling that what I would normally consider to be my inner guidance, you know, the kind of my intuition about things and the, my thoughts mm -hmm. were almost becoming, there was this sense that my dad was leading me through the whole through every moment of my life. I was doing it in concert with my dad, as though he was telling me what to do and how to, how to deal with it. Um, and, and then before I knew it, 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 it was, uh, it kind of extended from my dad to being my dad in heaven. And then my dad in heaven was God. And then before I knew it, I had, I was having this kind of, almost kind wow. of this experience or these messianic delusions about being in touch with with our father, the divine, my, uh, heaven, the con divine, contact yeah. with the divine, yeah, yeah, which I think was a kind of a stress re stress response, and that lasted a long time. Um, and so this was probably this was the beginning of May, and I was in the last year of my un of university, sitting my finals in the June time frame. Um, so I had to go back to Oxford where I was studying, sit my finals. Um, and I wasn't well at all, but this was really before mental health was much of a thing, you know. Of course, I mean, 30 years ago, my goodness. Nobody just, even talked about this. Yeah, the, and there weren't really, the, I mean, I didn't even see a doctor at the time. I think my mother and my sister wanted me to see a therapist at the time. Mm -hmm. I think they saw someone, but I thought I was fine. And I wasn't fine, <laughs> but I thought I was okay. And I was probably too proud to get help as well. I'm probably frightened of the strength of my feelings. Um, so I didn't get any help. And mm. I sat my finals really unwell, really high. Um, I wasn't sleeping at all. I was mm. in this kind of heightened state of, you know, talking very fast and very articulate. And Agitated. Confident, yeah. You know, all of that stuff going on. And then, um, and then after my finals, I ended up getting into a new relationship and the relationship I got into was with someone who had lost her mother to suicide when she was young mm. um, and, and she subsequently became my wife and we've got three children together and she's now my ex-wife mm -hmm. um, and 
And then, yeah, probably a few months after that, I went into a, into more of a kind of depressive phase, I guess, where I lost my energy. I was burnt out from the high. And I probably spent about a year or so in a, you know, in, in a kind of phase of relatively low mood, exhaustion, mm -hmm. just struggling mm -hmm. with, I think, what people would describe as depression. So you spent like years and years then? It was, it was like, what, six or seven years? No, no, this was, this, was, this was probably three months of high after my dad okay. died, and then maybe nine months or a year of low mood. Oh, okay. okay. Was, was and, and still, and, and you didn't share it with anyone? You didn't talk to anyone? No one ever came to you and said, listen, something, you know, maybe you need to see someone. You mentioned your mom and your sister, but did you share with anyone? I mean, did I just, you even I mean, know, I, actually, right? I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea, really. And no one else did either. And all of my friends were in their, you know, early 20s. And one of the friends I lived with, I remember he's, you know, he said, look, there were some things going on. We were worried about you and it, you were acting a bit strange, but we just didn't know what to do. And, you know, there was, I think I, I kept waking up and I, and I was convinced there was an alarm clock going off in the next door house. <laughs> and it was it, it, every morning I was, I it was having these kind of, I suppose it was like an auditory hallucination going on of uh -huh. some sort. But it was just the, I was under so much, I, was, I think I was dealing with so many emotions that I couldn't really handle. Yeah, and the way it, it was the way that I cracked, really. Yeah. Did you did you remember what you felt towards your father? Well, I think it's taken me thirty years to really get in touch with my feelings about my, my dad in a way, um, because for a long time I just wasn't, I was totally disassociated from them. I mean, the truth is that I was angry with him. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've had a lot of anger towards him that I haven't been able to express or even access. And it's come out sideways in relationship with other people, you know, authority figures, friends, you know, it's come, it's just come out. I get these clues, you know, as, I, as, as I've kind of become more self-aware, it's like, what, you know, why are you behaving like that, Jim, towards that certain person? And I realize actually, this is my anger towards my father coming out sideways. Um, yeah. And I have to try and put them together and I have to try and think, well, actually, the way that I'm responding to that person, if I can just think about my dad in the context of that relationship, then does that help me access some feelings? And sometimes it really does. In meditation, I can find it really brings up a lot of feelings that are otherwise, I don't know, somehow too, maybe it's too threatening or too overwhelming to face directly. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's been my experience. It, I've experienced nothing but feelings of love for my dad. And yeah. I know there's a lot of anger there. And I, I, I think mm -hmm. I need to get that. I need to get to that anger, really. Or I think I am getting to that anger now. Um, in because it's to too be... hard, isn't it? It's too hard to be angry at someone who died and to be angry at the father you loved. I don't know. I mean, you say it's too hard. I, I, you must be right because it, it's taken me 30 years and I'm only starting to, to really do it now and to really recognize though you know those situations where I have an opportunity to tap into that mm -hmm. I had the same thing with my mom as well um did you blame I, her because because you mentioned it was right after when she was getting ready to leave right they were getting divorced at the time well I, t I mean I didn't I guess I, I was angry with her, but I knew that some of that anger was not justifiable and that, that it was just a, in the context of their relationship and it was their business and it, it wasn't really right for me to be angry about it. I just was angry, but it was, I was angry unfairly about it. Um, but there were also some things that I was angry kind of fairly about, um, particularly that she went straight into a new relationship with the person that she'd been seeing and Mm -hmm. um, and because I think part of the problem is that we were all so cut up with our grief around my dad everybody reacted very differently um, <laughs> with those feelings did different things with those feelings and for my mum she wanted to, she blamed him really she blamed my dad and she didn't um, yeah and so she did say some terrible things about him after he died which I found very very hard and I was angry about that yeah. Um, yeah. And also she wasn't, I suppose I had an expectation of some kind of support from her and she wasn't able to give me any support about him. In, in fact, it's taken us 
30 years and a few sessions of therapy more recently to be able to start talking about my dad. Wow, um, 30 years to be able to talk about it, yeah. Yeah, really, yeah. For me to be able to say, to speak openly about him and just to, to say what I want to say and to remember him fondly. Um, it's taken a long yeah. time. You, you mentioned that your family, each, each one reacted differently. And can you tell me a little bit more? I mean, your mom, she, she, it sounds like she silenced about it. She didn't want to mention him. She didn't want to talk about it. And she was angry and she blamed him, blamed him for what happened. How about the rest of your family? My sisters, I, I think I was the one who had the kind of the, the probably the, you know, the most overtly challenging response to things in terms of suffering mental health problems and being the one who wanted, who probably went, went off and got the most support in the end, the most therapy, you know, joined the most groups, did the most work on myself, all, all that sort of stuff. And my three sisters have really, they've all responded in slightly different ways, but I've kind of, I've always had the feeling that, they, that they've been, they've coped and I haven't in some way. I don't know whether that's really right or not, but that's been my feeling. Um, but I don't know whether that's because, because they, they haven't entirely dealt with things and they've taken, you know, they, they've kind of bottled things up a bit and, mm. and just gone with their lives and their families and focused on, on themselves in that way, or whether it's because they've just been you know, kind of better able to cope with things. Um, yeah. I guess, you know, I was the one that was sent off to boarding school when I was eight in our family. And I think, I think there, there was something, I think that might've made it harder for me in some ways, because I don't know, in some ways I've, I've had, you know, I've been fortunate in that I had a good education, went off to top schools and, you know, did good jobs and stuff and was quite outwardly successful. But in terms of my emotional stability, I think I've been much more vulnerable. And I think my sisters have been much stronger emotionally in many ways and much more resilient. Um, mm -hmm. It's very interesting what you say, because I'm, I'm thinking now, looking from the outside, someone looking at you, I mean, you're still very involved with it. And you're 30 years later, you did a lot of work on yourself. You read books, you've, you are now actually training to be a therapist. And it, in a way, it's kind of a parallel with my situation too. It, it hasn't been 30 years with my dad, but it has been, I don't know, 15, 16 years. And I'm, I'm just thinking of people looking from the outside and say, well, they still haven't dealt with this enough. So it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, how do you know if someone has or not dealt with it? Because grief is ongoing. Grief doesn't end, right? It's not a, there's no one word that I really avoid when we talk about grief is closure. There's no closure for, for grief. It's an ongoing process. It gets easier. Yes, it does, but it, it's ongoing. So I'm just thinking here, thinking out loud that it, it, what you brought up is interesting. Well, what is that? Is this because I, I still haven't dealt with it or is it, or maybe they haven't dealt with it because they don't talk about it. They, they didn't really dig into it. So it, it's individual, right? You only know really by asking and talking. Have you talked to them about this? Have you asked them? I think, I mean, which is I mean, an observation on what you say, first of all, which is that I think trauma is like a cold storage thing. It kind of, if things happen that are traumatic, they can get lodged inside of you. And it's as though they're kind of ossified somehow and time doesn't matter. And so if you open it up a year later, or if you open it up 20 years later, it just doesn't matter actually. It's exactly the same lump of trauma. And if you haven't dealt with it and you haven't opened it up, it will be the same. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my belief anyway. And, uh, there were, you know, when I went back to SOBS, um, the kind of suicide support, you know, peer support group, I, I, I found that, that there were things, clearly there were things that I'd resolved inside myself and that, where I had moved on and there were things where I hadn't. And, um, you know, that, but being in an environment with other survivors and talking openly about these issues brings up a huge amount of, of feeling. It brings up a lot of emotion. And um, the, emo the, that, the emotion is what's trapped inside me, I believe, in the trauma. Uh, there's this kind of you know, trapped trauma. Um, and, you know, I believe it's how it, that, that these situations are, 
kind of dynamic and ever changing. And I don't believe they ever totally go away, but they, you know, but at the same time, you know, they become, I mean, I know for me that I can open up this thing. You know, I can open it up in groups, I can open it up with family members and it doesn't overwhelm me. And, you know, and I feel like I'm kind of okay. To, there's nothing I can't talk about now and there's nothing, and there's no one I can't talk to about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still, you know, it's still relatively, I think we're a long way away from a point where we can all as a family go out and, you know, really celebrate my dad's life. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a few things. We, you know, there's this thing in London uh, called Time to Change, which uh, Time to Talk, I think it is. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's an annual event for people who have been touched by suicide in some way. And I went on my own a few years ago then I invited all of my sisters to come and my mother and all of my sisters came with me about two years they ago. Did? Yeah. Oh, and it was, and it was amazing actually that we all came together to, to remember my dad. Amazing and very moving uh, for, you know, for the first time, almost 30 years on that we were all together and my mum still wouldn't come. Um, and I've said to her, I would love you to come. And she says, well, I, I wouldn't want, you know, I wouldn't want to be there. I wouldn't, I don't think you'd all want me to be there <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, so there's still some issues there, but I mean, for me, it would be nice if we could all go and it would be nice if my children could come as well and we could all just go and celebrate my dad's life in a way that's, that's fluid and where mm -hmm. if there are emotional blocks and if there's things people can't talk about, that the emotion starts to move a bit. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, equally, we all... You, you we talked all went, about... Oh, sorry. No, go on. Well, I was just going to give another example, but as a family, we all went and, and climbed a mountain together to raise money for a, a suicide charity, Maytree, um, that I was working as a trustee at. And that was a lovely thing. But actually, we all went and did it together. But I don't think we really all spoke about my dad very much, <laughs> if the truth, if truth be told. Um, and it's, it's hard with the suicide because I never really know if people want to talk about it or not. Yeah. And, and, the and sometimes I want to talk about it but I never know quite what reaction I'm going to get from the other family members um, because it does, you know, there are those deep wells of sorrow mm -hmm. and everyone, I've got to respect other people's ways of dealing with things as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you don't know, that's the thing with suicide too. You don't know how people will react and people don't know if you want to talk about it. You just mentioned your mom, right? There are so many uh, misunderstandings when it comes to suicide. She, you wanted her to come and she said, I didn't, I didn't know that you wanted me to come. I thought you wouldn't want me to come. So there's so many unspoken things too. It's, it's one of the things that silences us, I think about suicide too, is because there are so many uh, questions that we don't ask, but we assume, right? I think the feelings are so strong and there's, there's lots of different, there's the anger, there's the guilt. I mean, I think, because at the end of the day, in a, in a family system where, you know, everybody was really, you know, loving and compassionate and supportive, it would be quite hard for someone to kill themselves. You know, it's, it's only, you know, it's only because we'd all just been getting on with our own lives. And, you know, if, if we'd all been calling dad really frequently, <laughs> and if, if we'd all known quite how low he was, and one of us would have been out there with him or something would have happened. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's an inevitable amount of guilt, I think, in, in any situation. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the questions that are never answered because you're, you're saying this, but do you really know? I mean, can, do you really know that if someone were, was calling, if they were, maybe if I was more present, that's the thing too with suicide, we never know, right? No, we never know, but then life does go on. And, you know, I mean, I've come across, you know, quite a few people in, in, in recovery and in the various groups that I do um, who have been suicidal and who I've had contact with. And, you know, I think I've got a pretty clear idea now that with the right kind of support. Yeah. Through it. Yeah. 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 Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about your experience? Because you said it, it was like transformative for you to participate in these groups and, and support groups. What have you learned from support groups? Well, I think what I found was that the, the first thing I did was to join up to a charity called Maytree, where I worked as a trustee for a time. And I thought that was a good kind of, you know, uh, 
I think a kind of helpful thing to do basically. And I thought it would be a good way of giving back something. Um, but what I didn't realize was that I wasn't really taking care of myself and I'd never really opened up a lot of these issues. And that whereas I clearly had a lot of empathy for the cause of suicide and I, and I could understand, you know, people that were suicidal or people that were trying to help. I had, a, 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 you know, kind of had a lot of experience in that area, I guess. So I had my own experience of it. It wasn't really helping me. And so at a certain point, I think I realized that actually I had to take care of myself and work on my own recovery in order to have something to give in terms of, you know, helping people who were bereaved mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that was kind of yeah. And then actually, the, the, you know, uh, that going off and doing a charity commitment and trying to help other people was actually a form of delusion, really, because I, you know, I wasn't really helping myself. I was just channeling that energy into other people. And, um, you know, rather than really allowing myself to get in touch with my feelings about suicide, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. suicide and really work on, on, on the deep issues, the deep personal psychological issues, the emotions, the relationship issues, you know, the relationship issues in my family with my mother um, and my sisters and also in, in, in the family with my ex-wife and my children. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that was, I think, so the first charity commitment I was doing was really running away in some ways from the real issues. So, so then going into SOBS was starting to look at the real issues um, with therapy. But, but I just found sitting in a room of survivors, probably you know, 10 or 12 survivors, and the, the atmosphere in that room is just one of really emotional intensity. And we'd, we'd have a two hour session and the time would absolutely fly by. And I'd literally gonna have to, I'd have to go and lie down the next day, pretty much the whole day. I just have wow. to go and lie down, just because I, I, so much emotion had been released. Um, and, you know, it's a nice thing to be able to help other people, but it's also nice to be, allow myself to be vulnerable and to be helped. And that was where I struggled, I think. I found it, you know, I found it less threatening to try and help someone else than to allow myself to, to, to be helped. And, of course, uh, it's much easier than looking into yourself right yeah <clears throat> but you know I... you were you were you were talking about well there was a delusion it, i don't know i see it differently i'm just inviting you to see it differently it's, it was part of your process it was because you you went there and you tried that experience that you got in touch with the fact that i'm not ready for this so maybe that was the starting point of your healing mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's tied into kind of just like a, a deeper deeper psychological issues probably from being sent to boarding school at a young age because mm. you know, at, at eight years old what you want is to be at home with your mum and dad basically and but you're told that this amazing thing is happening to you where you're 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 going to be sent off to this incredibly privileged environment and it's a big sacrifice and mm. you know your parents are doing the best thing for you. You're supposed to be grateful, right? You're supposed to be grateful, grateful. Yeah. yeah. So what happened is I, you know, I learned to have a very thick exterior shell and keep my feelings totally hidden away. And I think that's, that, that same pattern played out in the way that I responded to a paternal suicide. You know, I was, I was trying to put on a front, I was trying to be okay, I was trying to be okay for everyone else, but I wasn't really doing, I wasn't doing anything for myself. I wasn't thinking, okay, what do I need? What I need is I don't yeah. know, not, not to be here. I need to be somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. it's um, interesting that you you talked about your father and how traumatic going to boarding school was, but the intergenerational trauma that you know it was repeated with you. And my mother was sent as well. And and when I had a conversation with my mother when it came up in therapy that, that just how damaging it had been to me, and I spoke to my mum about it, and she was upset to hear that. And then sometime later, she said actually. Actually, I feel the same. See? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's amazing the when you open the door, right? Mm -hmm. Things come in. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. Well, I am glad that you have been through this path and that you are healing and you're helping others. And I'm very, very privileged to have you here and to be the first one to hear your story publicly and to share with my audience. I'm sure there are a lot of people that, wow, 
I should, and that's that's why I bring people like you to the show. It's because I want someone, if one person is listening and they're saying, that sounds like me, you know, that mask, that thick wall, I have that thick wall and maybe I should do something about it. And it's totally worth it for me. <clears throat> one, if one person does that, it's been worth it. Thank you so much for participating and for being here with us. I'm going to end by reading something that you mentioned to me. You talked about the bench that you and your family built. Is it is it up yet? Has it, it been will approved? be any time. I think it's probably stuck in COVID, but it will be any time now. Yeah. Oh, everything's stuck in COVID. But anyway, when it is, this is something that you wrote about the bench that you were building in, in honor of your father. You said the bench is a symbol of how far things have come. I want to celebrate my father's life now, to remember him with dignity and love and allow myself to feel gratitude for all the happy times we had together. I'm so glad you can remember those times and thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you, Paula. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.